Freeberg, he loves to produce every 17th episode and does a great job. Oh, no, I like um, to prepare <laughs> or at least know what the heck we're going to talk about when we get together. And here are some prompts. He, he got these prompts because... Our producer not doing his job. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Producer. Oh, God. All right, so first up on uh, Freeberg's curiousness. This is... Uh, Freeberg. Right, this uh, is how you're going to do it. Let's skip ahead no, no. to the next section. Come on. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So um, go, go, go. Why do you think, Chamath, people love the podcast? Why do you think they listen? Why do you think they love it? What, what is the, the phenomenon? What, what, what lightning has been captured in this bottle? First is I think that they appreciate our friendship. It's kind of like odd and quirky. And I think a lot of, you know, it maps to like relationships that they have amongst their own friends. So that's what makes it relatable. But the second is that all of us uniquely have a point of view about stuff that matters more and more in the world. I think that's just the basics of it. Like, it's not like technology is going away. And it's not like its impact in the world is going away. And the more it becomes mainstream, the more it's important for a lot of folks to understand what's happening. And I think we provide a pretty unfiltered view of it. And we do it where, and this is a lot of credit to Sachs, more than anyone else on the show, has to take a counterpoint and steal man what would otherwise be controversial views. And if he didn't have his three friends around him, that would make the pod meaningfully worse, I think. Can but you explain that, for people who don't know what steel manning is, what that means? Well, just it just means like to, in, to have intellectual honesty around a point of view and actually put your best foot forward and trying to explain it, even when it's not orthodox, even when it's not what the mainstream would say is right. And so what it actually does is it creates a contrast against every other alternative that you have to learn about things, which you find incrementally is biased. Hmm. And I think that's what we've gotten right. We are four friends that have a reasonable point of view rooted in some amount of success. And I think that that's important because it gives us credibility. And we take all sides of issues. Yeah. And oftentimes, it is not the obvious, simple, reductive answer. And I think that that's where um, it really shines. Just Go so ahead, people Jay. know about the steel man argument, I just want to make sure people are clear on it. I think most people refer to it as the act of presenting the other argument in the strongest way possible to be intellectually honest. Like the opposite yeah, the of strong man. Exactly. Opposite the opposite of strong man. man. Because the, the, way, the way the debate happens on Twitter and so forth is it's almost like the intellectual debate is uh, being attacked uh, using opposition research tactics, like it were a political campaign. So in other words, they go back through anything you might have said or written, take the, the, the thing that was most wrong or least justifiable or the thing they can even just take out of context, and then they'll try to make it about that as opposed to the argument you're actually making. And we just see this tactic over and over again. And it's not uh, an intellectually rigorous way of having a debate about something. You don't learn anything. Right. And deep down inside, you know that it's contrived. And that is the, in a nutshell, so it has, it almost in many ways has less to do with how good we are, but frankly, how bad all the alternatives are. So even if you wanted to learn about tech, and you go up and you sign up for these uh, newsletters, or if you look at some of these tech sites, they're really terrible. And they have done an increasingly terrible job over the last five years in telling the most important things, the truth and everything in between. And so if you can find a source for an hour a week, that is trying to tell you how basically the world is going to come together in a really integrated multifaceted way. It's not like we're right. And it's not like we know better than other people. In fact, many times, a lot of the criticism I get is, how dare you talk about X or how dare you talk about Y? Because it makes people who are experts in that field, you know, feel like, how dare you come into my realm and even have an opinion on, you know, uh, what Russian politics was like in the 1980s. And those things really annoy these folks because they feel that those opinions and that knowledge should be cordoned off and held tightly as this secret that only they are allowed to talk about into the world. And this is the point where with the internet, all this knowledge is accessible. So the value of that knowledge, in my opinion, is the least it's ever been. It's the interpretation that's valuable. And it's the ability to actually like think narratively around how all these things connect. And this is where I give a lot of credit. I think you guys do an incredible job. I think the way Friedbrook thinks is super unique. I think the way that Saxis thinks is unique. I think, J. Cal, your courage to basically fight back 
is very special. All of it together is a really unique recipe. It works. And what I will tell you consistently is the number of people that listen to this of import and influence. I am constantly shocked. And if you are not sure of it, you need to get out of this stupid little echo chamber of Silicon Valley, go to New York, go around the world. And if you're in the right meetings, it's incredible how folks are getting educated using this pod. And I think that's, that's really amazing. Yeah, I do think I, I think there's like been a tendency in like what we call media today, historically kind of, you know, communication amongst humans. It, it was very slow for a communication cycle to go from beginning to end to close because we had print and books and then telegraphs and then telephones and then television and then and radio. And the internet, I think, has really changed the cycle, um, the loop cycle to the point that, you know, a story iterates and proliferates very quickly. And a lot of people talk about the news cycle being very short nowadays. And what that means is that there is a group think approach to resolving to a point of view on what the news is. So the news comes out, everyone iterates on it, they form their point of view, and all of a sudden everyone's on the same point of view. And so there is no room for dissent or debate or discussion because the cycle closes so quickly and everyone coalesces around the same point of view. And nowadays, I think we see not just that unipolar behavior, but we see this bipolar behavior where everyone coalesces on their point of view and how their point of view is, is the opposite of the other side. And everyone has their own heuristic for what the other side is. There's this populism versus elitism siding. There's this red versus blue siding. There's this us versus them siding, US versus China siding. Everything is now bipolar. And so you very quickly coalesce around what your poll says and what your poll is instructing you to believe. And that is what is fundamentally wrong with how the system is working today. And I think what people find refreshing about a discourse that doesn't succumb to that bipolarity as a standard is that it provides people the ability to have a real rational, out of sync point of view that maybe changes one's point of view and changes one's mind in a meaningful way. And I think that's what's really missing today. And I think maybe sometimes we do a good job and we touch on that. And so that's what I would strive to do is to always try and avoid that bipolarity on everything. You know, the um, Zen Buddhists call it dualistic thinking, you know, <laughs> the human brain and generally the universe seems to evolve into this kind of dualism on everything. And it's not really always the case that there are shades of gray that there um, is nuance, uh, that there is a complex uh, dimensionality to things that I think people really, if they take the time to understand, recognize that maybe it's not left and right, maybe it's not elite and populism, maybe it's not all black and white. Uh, and that's an important, hopefully, framing that maybe we can bring, bring, bring to light through, through our diagnosis of what's going on in things right now. Yeah, and I, I, I'd like to add to that. I think there's there's a ton of great journalism going out there. We see it. Um, there's a ton of great sub stacks out there. People go deep. There's other great podcasts out there. And right now, it's a tumultuous time for media journalism and, and getting information and do what trust what sources do we actually trust? Who actually is thinking in a crisp way, um, and informing people and, you know, having been a former journalist, when we were journalists, we knew that we would get 10, 20, 30, 40% of a story, we would publish it. And, and we would try our best. Uh, but journalism has tr changed dramatically in the last 20 years. And I can tell you journalism is dead. Sorry. Okay. Just, well, I'm sorry. There, I'm there's sorry. still Jur some great journalism occurring. It's on the margins. It, it, it's irrelevant. And I'll tell you why. Because the facts are known instantaneously on Twitter and through the internet. We don't need people to relay facts. We need people to wrap facts in context and allow us to come to our own conclusions. That's why I think journalism isn't what it used to be. That's why people who are historically journalists struggle because now they actually have to create context and narrative and have an opinion. But when you publish that into the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, it becomes very confusing. They don't know that that's what they were supposed to do. That's not what they used to do. That's not how Pulitzer Prizes were were historically given out. And that's why everybody then, you know, rants and well, rails about things kind of going is, you yeah. know, if you if you look at it, as journalists, people don't know this, but journalists are being compensated, their little salaries in many cases are based on their follower counts, they're based on what audience they're bringing to the table. And you see this in Substack. Substack just said, we're going to hire the top journalists on, who have the most followers on Twitter. But you have to change the word so that you change how people think about it. These people are not journalists. 
These people are opinion makers. Okay, in some cases, they're doing journalism. In some cases, no, they're, they're staying not. No, no, there are some cases where they're actually doing real journalism, Chama. There are people doing investigative reporting still. It's not the majority of what you see, but it still exists. It, it's just a very much smaller percentage. But putting that aside, if you think about but how you can't, you can't account, wrap a virtuous blanket around every a thousand people because of the acts of one. I, I'm not, and I'm not. I said there's a range here. It's a small percentage, but this there's what, still what random acts of great journalism. Is, what do you think that percentage is? of content creation? I put it at five percent. So That's you know, a huge one out number. of twenty. I'm yeah. shocked. Yeah. I, anyway, I think it's less than one percent. But let me just finish this one thought here. It, you know, if you are going to be hired and compensated. And we, we talk about systems here a lot. So just thinking from first principles, if you're a journalist, if you're a writer, opinion writer, whatever, you produce content for Wall Street Journal, for podcasts, etc. Today, let this sink in, your follower count is what your book advance is. It's what your compensation is. It's who hires you. Now, if that's the truth, and it's it's not all the time, but I think Which the majority is a proof of time. point uh, that your job is not to relay facts. We can get facts exactly. from a thousand that's sources. Let me finish my thought here. And so then what happens is how is follower count on Twitter actually derived? How do you get that follower count? By being tribal. And so what's happened is journalists have become tribal. They get big followings. They give spicy takes. They pick a side. And then their compensation follows it. And that's why New York Times said, can we all stop on Twitter? And they literally put an edict out. Then you look at this podcast, I think people look at us as, you know, in their mixture, podcasting long form, taking the time week after week to spend 90 minutes chopping these things up. I think that's what to the original question Freeberg you had is what people find so great. I, I when people ask me, I say it's really about the fact that there's a there's a friendships here. And it's funny. But it's also informative. And it's insightful. And at times, as you pointed out, Chamath, um, you know, random acts of bravery and taking positions that are not popular. And, the, and to think that you and Freeberg almost blew this up over a few hundred K. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, the two of you equally should wouldn't, share. I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it that way. By the way, I think yeah, the point. Here the, we go. Now the bad feelings are ready. Getting spicy. Just, uh, can no, I, can I, have, I, uh, I have, I have more of an ethical framework, but yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Ooh, that's, yeah. Even worse. <laughs> Look at your moth stirring the pot. Just to chime in on this point, I mean, I think I'm in violent agreement with you guys, but I'd frame it a little differently. I think the reason why people seek out our podcasts and other podcasts and Substacks is, and, and sort of this kind of independent journalism and are willing to pay for it, is because the mainstream media has become totally devoid of substance. It's as partisan and, ideolo and ideologized as it's ever been. Reporters are extremely ideological. You look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the you know major television networks. It's all kind of the same thing. And yeah, there is like you know a little bit of an echo chamber problem in terms of the partisan politics. But the mainstream media is the most ideologized it's ever been. I mean, just to give you one small example that we talked about in the pod, the you know we had two quarters of negative GDP growth which the media has always considered to be the definition of recession. And then all of a sudden they said, no, we can't know what a recession is anymore because they know that'd be a horrible headline for Biden right before the midterm elections. That's more of a partisan version. I think on the, you know, a more ideological version would be just around this Ukraine war. I mean, it's just incredible how biased the coverage is. They don't even present the other side of the story, like let's call it the Mearsheimer take about how we got to this point that we're in. So the American people just aren't being informed at all. I, you know, it, we, we, we love to talk about how the people of all these other countries are being propagandized by their governments. We never talk about how propagandized the American people are. The media does not present the other side of the story at all on how we got into the Ukraine war and how we're now at the brink of what Biden calls Armageddon. Yeah. So and how we are we going to get it, out of it? How are we going to get out of it? Any topic, by the way. I, I, I said so that true. was my punch. Because yeah, so topics. many topics yeah. that we see, you know, effectively short form and short form, meaning it can be presented in a sound bite or on a TikTok clip or in a couple paragraphs where someone's attention span before someone's attention span lapses out, always misses the dimensionality that got us to that point. And so there's one perspective, one point of view uh, on one dimension. And the dimension like Sachs is talking about, about the time and the history of the dynamics of all the countries and all the people and all the interactions that have happened for the past couple of decades that led up to this moment. But then this moment is taken in its context alone and reclassified as being something that is good versus evil. It completely misses the entire storyline of what happened. It's like going to the 
end of a fairy tale and saying, here's this moment of what happened and all the buildup and all the things that occurred are often missing and all the different sides of the story are missing. And I think that that's really what makes it so difficult today to feel like you can trust authority and that you can trust the, the, the media that's presented to you as a consumer, not just in the US or in the West, but around the world, because there's so much that's left out and manipulated and kept away. And what people are waking up to is the fact, as Chamath points out, that so much of that information, the direct information is available now. And so this investigation, this ability to uncover the data and the storylines and the perspectives that are typically missing from one form of media is making people realize that there's so much that's being left out. The lie of omission. 100%. 100%. And I think in this podcast- And that's what's really shocking to people nowadays. And I think that's what makes maybe to some degree hold our hold conversation hold a little more appealing. I'll, 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 I'll drop to you uh, in a second there, Sachs. But I did see this happen in three specific topics that we discussed here. Uh, if you remember, we talked about abortion. And we were on that topic very early. And no one wanted to talk. I remember when we started talking about the number of weeks, maybe how Europe looks at this. That wasn't part of the popular conversation. It was always just, are you against choice? Are you for killing babies? It, it was like a very two dimensional look at it. Immigration, same thing. Nobody would talk about the numbers. Nobody talked about recruitment. Nobody talked about the point systems used in other countries. It was almost like those basic things were not allowed to be discussed. Why can't the media discuss those nuances? And freedom of speech is, I think, the biggest one. And the search for truth. You know, nobody wants to talk about the fact that the ACLU used to actually protect unpopular speech. And unpopular speech is, you know, the hardest thing in the world to protect. But how did that become something we can't even talk about now? Right. And, and just the snap uh, silencing of any opinion, whether it's Chappelle or, you know, pick a topic in freedom of speech, Trump, etc. You know, who gets protection for freedom of speech? And we'll talk about it later in the news with Alex Jones, obviously, a very uh, controversial topic as well. Go ahead, Sachs. You want to add something to well, it? Well, I think just to take this Ukraine situation as an example, I think the media's biggest power is the power to define when time begins on an issue. So what especially if, yeah, well, mean? like right with Ukraine, we're part of an escalatory spiral that's been going on for well more than eight or nine months. This issue has been going on since 2000. A decade. Yeah. More over decade. a decade. So yeah. in other words, if you come in, in like the seventh inning, okay. So to Freeworks point, you come in at the end of the story and it's been an escalatory spiral, but the media just pretends like time begins on February 24th. Of course, you're going to have a certain kind of view on the subject. Whereas if you know the history of the situation, if you know that back in the 1990s, you had people like George Kennan, who was the architect of our Cold War containment policy. You had uh, William J. Perry, who was Bill Clinton's defense secretary. You had Henry Kissinger. You had John Mearsheimer, all warned that bringing NATO right up to Russia's front porch was extremely provocative to them, that they would see that as a provocation. It would eventually lead to a moment of crisis. When that moment of crisis finally came, you know, we're not told that this was predicted. We're told that anyone who says that this war has anything to do with NATO expansion is basically a Putin apologist and is spouting Putin talking points. All right. Let's not let's not let's save some of that for the Ukraine talk. We're going to talk but about my, my in the news section. Just, no, but listen, I get your point. You could, sure. you could agree or disagree with that take. But the point is, the media doesn't even portray it. They really just pick a side and they I think I like your analogy of like just coming in for the last 15 minutes of the game and just describing that, you know, we, you need to have a deeper discussion of how did we get here? How did we get here on immigration? Why don't we have a point system? Why do we look at people suddenly coming from south of the border differently than we did just 20 years ago? How did that become a politicized issue? What's the right solution here? Especially if we can't hire people f for basic jobs in the United States. I everybody wants to know this question. What, what's your favorite? You have a favorite moment or a least favorite moment, a, a, a great moment in the show history. And, th and then I guess we'll move on maybe to some audience questions here. But let's let's get this one because an embarrassing moment, your favorite moment, your least favorite moment, a, a moment now you look back on and you, you're, you're particularly proud of. Chima. I love the cold opens. I, I think that they are uh, unbelievably human and funny and normalizing. They are by far the best part of the pod, in my opinion. <laughs> And yeah, th that's my that's my absolute favorite part by by like miles and miles. Uh, Sax, you got a favorite moment other than Ukraine, other than Ukraine. Probably I know you got you Ukraine started, on the brain. Probably you, when you started talking like Joe Pesci. 
The Joe <laughs> Pesci voice. <laughs> I can't do it on command. I'm not your monkey sacks. Don't you talk <laughs> to me like that. <laughs> I'll get a fucking bat in here. <laughs> oh, no, seriously, you have any other favorite moments? Or, um, or, or things you're particularly proud of, things that people tell you, you know, hey, I love what do you I love this part of the show. I'm also proud that we we were able to air our dirty laundry a little bit in public and still get over ourselves and our own egos and we're still here. I think that takes a lot of courage and a little bit of a little bit of maturity that's that's not in uh public visibility all the time in the media. So I like I, I like that sentiment a lot. I think there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. They were uncomfortable about it, you know, I I think there's a lot of personal growth that's going on here uh, for all for everybody involved. Yeah, a Freeberg, you got a favorite moment? Other, you know, uh, I don't like or, it when you and Sax fight. That's <laughs> just annoying. That's your least favorite I mean, moment when we argue. Yeah, I, just, I, li- I literally turn I turn my headphones off and I like do some emailing. I, it's, it that really happens. is just it. It really is just this political thing. But yeah, it does come up. I, you know, I don't like the fact all the that moments I've been interrupted by you that like that. <laughs> Just happened five seconds ago. Like, you know, those are usually pretty tough. <laughs> go, go ahead. I don't know. No, I, what, I, what I did enjoy, I did enjoy meeting people at the summit who shared that this has been like a really important thing for them to listen to. I, I think I, I was at a Pete's Coffee in the city and some guy came up to me. This was when early after uh, early when we were doing the podcast and he was like listening to you guys has really helped me get through COVID. And he was like locked in his apartment and he didn't have a lot of friends and he didn't have a lot of people to talk with. And just being able to hear through, you know, kind of a a good conversation around when's this gonna end? How's COVID gonna, you know, what's gonna change in the city and hearing our friendship really made a big difference for him. And it was actually really interesting. That was off the show, but it made me realize that the show actually is impactful and helpful and made, gave me kind of the energy to keep going, even though I've had uh, frustrations um, in the past. So I don't know. I, I like I like those moments a lot, to be honest. That there's real value here for people. I, I also I thought the summit was a lot of fun. I mean, I had a good time. Well, I, you know, it's uh, I, I think we're steering towards I think we're steering towards summit 2023. That was me stirring <laughs> the pot a little bit. I think <laughs> one and done, think we're baby. Steering towards 2023. One and done. One I, listen, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, you do it, you produce it, or you hire a producer, I'll show done. up. I'm, if you, I don't need to make a producer <laughs> fee, you can do it, you can take.